Hello, everybody, and welcome to another wonderful night of Windfall Poetry Reading. Uh, my name's Wendy, and I work at the Eugene Public Library, and I'm so glad you're all here to enjoy a wonderful night of poetry. Um, a couple things to start with. Uh, first of all, I want to thank a couple of different groups for making this night and every Windfall reading series, which we have once a month, possible. Uh, that would first of all be the Lane Literary Guild, without which such a group could not be possible. They're fantastic. They have a ton of different programs. In fact, let me go ahead and put up their info here so you can look them up and I'll put this up again in a little bit when Henry Alley, who is the head of the Lane Writers Guild, Lane Literary Guild, comes to introduce our poet today, this evening. Um, so uh, thank you so much for Lane Literary Guild. It's so exciting to have such a great group in the Eugene and Lane County area. I also wanted to thank the friends of the Eugene Public Library. They make so many of our programs possible and it's just delightful that we have them here and able to uh, facilitate so many programs. Um, again, the library would not run like it does without their generosity and their support. So thank you so much, the friends of the Eugene Public Library. Um, if you have questions, there will be a Q&A of some sort at the end of the reading. And you can do that a couple of different ways. You are welcome to send me an email. Let me go ahead and get that up in place of the Lane Literary Guild. So if you're feeling a little shy and don't want to post your comments just straight down below in the, um, Eugene, uh, the YouTube page, which is another way you can do it, is by sending us a comment in the YouTube page. Just type it in and we will read it at the end. You're also welcome to email me and I'll check my email throughout the reading. And at the end, when you have, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to read them for you. So feel free to drop me an email at wbeck at eugene-or.gov. All right, so uh, hold on to your questions. Uh, Grab yourself a beverage and a snack and get ready for a wonderful night of reading. I'm now going to introduce Henry Alley, who is the Lane Literary Guild's chair. Yeah, let me just get him up here. Hello, Henry. You know, you're muted. Hello, Wendy. Perfect. Hi. So great to be here tonight, and thanks to everybody for coming. Um, and please keep in mind some of the uh, websites that we've been mentioning. Um, we are very excited that David Bradley is going to be reading for us. He was, he's been here and lived lived in Eugene for a number of years, and has been such a luminary as a novelist. Uh, I do need to say before um, I introduce him for a longer reading that unfortunately Susan Moore cannot be with us tonight um, because of the freeze that's up in Portland that's taken away um, the internet connection. I'm very sorry to hear that. However, we have rescheduled her for May 18th um, at the regular windfall time of 6 p.m. And that'll be on a Tuesday. And I'll remind you of the other people that will be reading uh, in, in the future toward the end of this program. Um, <clears throat> I want to mention, too, that the Lane Literary Guild has been with me since 1984 uh, when it was formed. And I am very proud to have been a part of the experience there. And to say that Lane County has been just a rather remarkable area for the formation of poetry, nonfiction, fiction for just a number of years. And to see that kind of creativity evolve over time has been re a real privilege. So uh, tonight I'm going to introduce David, who's going to read a little longer than we planned. Um, and um, I want to give a particular uh, canvas to his wonderful background. David is the author of two novels, South Street, 1975, and The Cheneysville Incident, 1981, which was awarded the 1982 Penn Faulkner Award and an Academy Award uh, from the American Academy and Institute of Arts and Letters. Both novels have been issued in electronic format by Open Road Media, um, and there is a, a link that you can uh, tap into for that. And I want to say I've listened to the, some of the reading of the Cheneysville incident, it is quite remarkable. 
His most recent fiction, You Remember the Pin Mill, appeared in Narrative and was selected for the 2014 O. Henry Prize. His, his essay, A Eulogy for Nigger, was awarded the 2015 Notting Hill Editions Essay Prize. Since 1985, David has worked primarily in creative nonfiction, publishing in Esquire, Red Book, The New York Times, The Nation, The Los Angeles Times, The New Yorker, and other journals and newspapers. David has also published articles on and introductions to works by Millville, Twain, Richard Wright, William Melvin Helvey Kelly, and Edmund Wilson, and has co-edited with Shelley Fisher Fishkin the Encyclopedia of Civil Rights in America in 1998, and The Sport of the Gods and Other Essential Writings of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, 2005. David holds a BA in Creative Writing from the University of Pennsylvania and an MA in the United States Studies from the University of London. He has been a permanent faculty member at Temple University in Philadelphia and the University of Oregon in Eugene and a visiting professor at Colgate University, MIT, the University of North Carolina at Wilmington, the College of William and Mary, the City University of New York, the Mishner Center for, at the University of Texas, and Austin PA State University in Tennessee, Tennessee. He has been the recipient of fellowships from the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts. In 2018, he was elected to the Bedford High School Hall of Excellence. He is currently at work on a volume of creative nonfiction the Bondage Hypothesis, Meditations on Race, History, and America, a collection of essays, lunch bucket pieces, and a novel and stories called Race Down. Born and raised in Western Pennsylvania, he now lives in La Jolla, California. And I just want to say, you know, I have been going through uh, some of David's uh, fiction, and I've just been struck by, you know, not only how it's shaped in a very complex way, but, but also how he has a kind of a remarkable image, sense of imagery and a way of conveying uh, to you a very vivid, um, a vivid world of just taking from an early part of the Cheneysville incident, there is this description of, um, it was it's described here where he's in this young you know, this young boy is in the backwoods and said i would lose him and would stand in the midst of the forest dark trees rising on either side listening to the pounding of my heart as i realized that i was alone on the far side of the hill it was then at those times that i learned the most not woodcraft really or perhaps a true form of woodcraft to bring my breathing under control to still my fear to be methodical to accept my limitations and compensate. You know, this, uh, this really gives a new kind of context to what the word, um, to the, what that word wordcraft, woodcraft would mean. And then in, a, in his more recent piece, he describes a barbershop this way in a very, in a very vivid way as well. You remember the red striped pole, the sense of clothes, bay rum and talk the trout and the white tail leaping on dog-eared magazines, the slap swish of razor on strop, the chair like the lazy boy, only it was your grandpa in it and his face creamed with lather and wishing you had whiskers too. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our reader tonight, David Bradley. Thanks, Henry. I, did, did I unmute successfully? <laughs> Uh, I hope I did. Um, somebody let me know. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, great. Um, this is strange. I, I apologize for my awkwardness. I have never uh, done this before, and I'm pleased to be with you, even though I'm not with you. And I wish I were because I have very fond memories of, of Eugene and several watering holes that I won't mention because they're probably closed. But I want to thank you all for being here and thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm going to read, since I have a little more time, I'm going to go back a little further than I would have intended. Oh, before I continue, let me 
do something my publisher will kill me if I don't say uh, that is the, the Cheneysville incident will be uh, reissued uh, in I think in the fall uh, 40th anniversary 40th uh, anniversary edition which is kind of scary when you think about it but hey you know and I've been working on a new introduction so there will be some parts of it that are new um, the first little thing I'm going to read is um, was written in request uh, for a piece on magic. Uh, the idea was that a bunch of writers were going to get together and we were all going to write about magic. And it will be in, was, uh, in Washington, D.C. in September of 18. So I thought I'd start here because at least we can... <laughs> COVID has nothing to do with it. Um, here we go. When I was summoned to appear and speak of magic, I thought, presto, Arthur C. Clarke's third law. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I woke my MacBook and conjured Google just to check Clarke's wording, but the at imp Wikipedia whispered, Charles Fort, reminding me Fort also defined magic, but as a performance that may someday be considered understandable, but that in these primitive times, transcends what is said to be known. And I had a vision of my younger self writing the Cheneysville incident, a novel, but unlike current news, a fiction based on facts. What I saw most vividly was not the story of my methods and material. I haunted and used bookstores and library stacks, made notes on cards of many colors. I typed for seven years on a typewriter, electric, thank God, but thank God also for a corrasable bond. I revised using Xeroxing pages and cutting and pasting paragraphs using not Command X but an exacto knife and best, te uh, best test paper cement thinned with bestine solvent. Ah, the aroma. Toxic. That's the bomb. <sighs> I look back and wonder. Before G Steve Jobs ignored his daughter to build the computer for the rest of us and Al Gore invented the internet, I had somehow written a whole book. This led me to formulate Bradley's Law. From a perspective accustomed to sufficiently advanced technology, performances under previous primitive conditions are indistinguishable from magic. Then I marveled further, recalling that in those days I was not only primitive, but black. It would be seven years before Jesse, Ramona, and Johnny Duncan decreed that to shift the definition of the group from the racial description to a cultural and ethnic identity ties that the group that ties the group to the continent of origin and fosters dignity and self-esteem, I should henceforth be African American. When I read that announcement in the Times back in 89, my first thought was, no, I will not type 15 letters instead of five. My second thought was, hmm, I wonder if they're paying by the word. But magazine editor said, sorry, the hyphen made it one word, and I said, dog, mumbo jumbo, been dead in the Congo since 1915, and kept on being black. This African-American hoodoo did conjure a president who some said was a magical Negro, and another was the first coming. But he played golf instead of beating on the table with the handle of a broom, and in magic, words are both precise and literal. You get that incantation wrong and you end up in bed with a congressman and a president born on no continent who invites cops over for beer and invents policies that make no difference in the lives or deaths of people formerly known as black. Still, the incantation was based on ancient principles found in medieval grimoires. The law of similarity states a magician can act on an object or person from a distance by manipulating a simulacrum like a doll provided said, magi said magician chants the proper incantation. The law of names states the incantation gains power from the invocation of the true and complete name of the, that object or person, although to affect persons, sorcerer and sorcerers must share the language and culture. But assuming cultural commonalities, analysis of the laws of magic does suggest social change may be affected without major funding or landmark legislation using what you could call voodoo sociology. Some similar magic has worked in America since the first days of the Republic, when Satan possessed our founding fathers and turned them into mothers who claimed liberty for themselves and their posterity, but saw no sin in buying men, women, and even children in Africa and bringing them to America as slaves. 
to ensure this negrom negromancy would endure despite all declarations of human equality, Satan stole the name of a river in Africa, no Oprah, not that river, corrupted its pronunciation into an epithet signifying that these Africans were lesser beings destined for enslavement and went to and fro teaching it to their true and complete name so it could be used in lieu of chains. Many believed for years Satan's spell had power, but in time this nation under God repudiated devilment. But as it is written, the past is never dead, it's not even past. Though now by the charity, diversity, even multiculturality, the greatest of these is guilt. Satan's epithet is a reminder of sins, atrocities, and hypocrisies, and has become the name that must not be spoken. Some years ago, an Alabama publisher tried to purify the past by casting the name out of one of our greatest historical novels. His spell, or spell check, failed somewhere south of Charlottesville. Now other wizards try to do the same using not exorcism, but circumcision. They use the name's initial letter, but replace the rest with a hyphen and word. Once I found this ridiculous. Recently, I've reconsidered. Perhaps it is ingenious reinterpretation of magic's ancient laws, a counterspell using not the complete name, but a truncation, a doll with parts cut off. And what if this myelistic sociology actually worked? Perhaps had we all, including Lil Wayne, been using N-word all these years, Michael Brown, Sandra Bland, and Laquan McDonald would still walk among us. This is right straight off the page here. And what if similar counterspells could banish other evils? What if using C-word, C-word, would slow global warming? What if instead of baptizing hurricanes, we damned them with H-word? Perhaps 3,000 Puerto Ricans would not truly be dead. Maybe if we said S-word, H-word, women would be work unmolested, perhaps even for equal pay. Maybe all our trials and hearings, Lord, would soon be over if, henceforth, in lieu of protest, in all op-eds, op op tweets, posts, and conversations, instead of the true and complete name, we simply used T-word. And maybe it's time this N-word disappeared. Shazam. At that point, uh, in that particular uh, <laughs> performance, I got the hell out of Dodge. Um, that was during the hearings for uh, one of the one of the guys who got on the Supreme Court, so you'll understand why I refer to that. Um, more recently, I have been keeping what I call well, I call the journal <laughs> the journal of the plague year until further notice. Um, this is one of the well, actually it will be the opening uh, section of that. Now you have to stand. I'm not writing this for anybody. I'm writing it for me. Um, and the idea was not to do anything with it, but so happens that I was asked to read. So here we go. This section, uh, it's called On the Ides of March. And it begins with a quote from Julius Caesar, Act 3, Scene 1. Caesar, the Ides of March are come, soothsayer, I, Caesar but not gone. In the year of our Lord 2020, of Prophets 5781, of the nation 232, and the Chinese, the rat, one began keeping a journal. Unlike many writers, one had never done so before. Although several of one's early teachers had recommended journaling to develop skills of observation and description, to make a record of one's experiences and reflections, and to, as one teacher put it, communicate with your future self. And although one did want to polish one's prose, one did not find one's own experience worthy of accuracy, and decided to gift one's future self with the mutability of memories and the absolution of amnesia. One wanted to write fiction anyway. But in the last days of the year of the pig, just before Chinese New Year, in fact, the New York Times reported that a man of unspecified nationality, but in his 30s and a resident of Snohomish County, Washington, had been conclusively diagnosed as suffering from 
a mysterious respiratory infection first reported in Wuhan, China, and so now known as Wuhan coronavirus, which, as the American Centers for Disease Control and Prevention had earlier announced, had killed at least six people and sickened hundreds more in Asia. The outbreak, the Times reported, began in a seafood and poultry market in Wuhan. The man, who did develop symptoms after returning from a trip to the region around Wuhan in mid-January, told doctors he had not visited animal markets in Wuhan. A professor of medicine at Vanderbilt University told the Times that while the source likely was the live animal market and cautioned anyone traveling to China to avoid visiting live animal markets and to keep a distance from all live animals, he also admitted there were questions that we don't know the answers to. While headlining the first patient in the U.S., the Times also reported the possibility of a second patient in North America, also of unspecified nationality, but identified as a 57-year-old researcher in a university biotechnology lab who lives and works in Reynosa, a Mexican city economically and culturally conjoined with McAllen, Texas, to form one of six international conurbations along the border. Just after the Chinese New Year, the Los Angeles Times headlined California's first two cases of coronavirus. The lead indicated the disease had been brought by travelers who came from the epicenter of the outbreak in Wuhan, China. In fact, one patient was a Wuhan resident who was flying through Los Angeles airport on his way back to China, but presented them themselves immediately for care at LAX airport once they noticed that they weren't feeling well. The other, about whom the Times did not even give gender-neutral details, was somewhere in Orange County. The Times also reported that Chinese authorities had banned transportation or sale of wildlife and warned that they would severely investigate and punish violators. Given the previous behavior of the Chinese government, one had to doubt the adverb was properly placed, especially as this action seemed to be a response to the assumption that the source of the Wuhan virus was not, as the New York Times described it, a seafood poultry market, but what is known as a wet market, where live animals, including wildlife, were sold for DIY butchering and human consumption. According to the National Geographic, experts estimate these markets could number in the hundreds, and even some department and big box stores also sell wild meat. The National Geographic quoted one expert at the University of Houston who said that, while only the affluent could afford soup made with palm civet, fried cobra, or braised bear paw, among the less affluent, frogs were a common wildlife. But an epidemiologist at the UCLA Center for Global and Immigrant Health suggested wildlife might not be the problem. We don't know how easily people transmit the virus, she told the Times. We just don't know that true risks. Still, she added, fear spreads a lot faster than the virus itself. We need to make sure that people do not have undue worry. One is not prone to undue worry. And while one had dined occasionally at P.F. Chang's, neither fried cobra nor frog made one's mouth water. But one does live in Southern California, in an American city which is part of an international conurbation. Also, one is male, and I live in New York Times headline asked, Why is the coronavirus so much more deadly for men than for women? Also, one was, or had been, expecting to turn 70 in September. One had even delayed applying for Social Security to maximize payments to one's future self. But on Leap Day, the New York Times reported that, based on statistics from China, older people are much more likely to face serious illness if infected. They are also much more likely to die. And also, one is black, and throughout what is now called African American History Month, it was being whispered that the immigrant virus, officially renamed COVID-19, so as not to consult any geographical location, animal, individual, or group, and become sufficiently naturalized to exhibit racial bias. These whispers were based only on observation, anecdote, and history, and perhaps, perhaps a bit of paranoia. They could therefore not support a responsible scientific opinion. Still, they were confirmed by peer reviews and eventual outcome. Shortly after the end of February, it was confirmed COVID-19 was especially dangerous, make that fatal, the persons were black. Thursday, March 12th, 
in what had become an annual ritual, one dined with similarly aged friends visiting from out of state. Although our usual restaurant does not offer a senior citizen discount, we are sufficiently affluent to afford, afford whatever we desire. Dynamite shrimp, wok seared barbecued pork spare ribs, crab wontons, compound dragon roll, Peking duck, the fried rice and lo mein, and of course, a great wall of chocolate. A good time was had by all, as we are long past worrying about acne. But on Friday the 13th, According to the Times of London, the British Prime Minister was obliged to deliver the kind of message the Prime Minister delivers only in time of war and tell the British public many more families are going to lose loved ones before their time. And according to the Times of New York, the American President declared a national emergency, although by midnight the White House announced that POTUS would not be tested or quarantined. And although to the Times of Los Angeles, according to the Times of Los Angeles, Although operations had been halted in response to only three prior events, the assassination of President Kennedy, the earthquake in Northridge, and the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center, the threat of COVID-19 had shut down the world's most famous amusement park, an international symbol of the Southern California good life. The headline was, Life as we know it suspended indefinitely. One has never been to Disneyland, but one has lived in Southern California on and off for 40 years. And one is fond of life as one knows it, which fondness perhaps prompted a letter to the board of one's condominium association, which, on account of COVID-19, voted to deny access to the deck surrounding the community swimming pool. As the pool wasn't heated, no one was swimming. The only effect was to restrict sunbathing. One's letter noted that the board's justification was not medical, but legal advice and compared it to the Nazis' Nuremberg defense. But in the board's defense, shortly thereafter, various government officials elected and unelected of the state of California and for the county of San Diego and and or municipalities incorporated therein, closed hiking trails, bike paths, parks, parking lots, beaches, and the Pacific Ocean. Surfing was prohibited. It seemed that under, until further notice, the Southern California good life would be defined as Baywatch lifeguards ticketing Jan and Dean for going goofy foot in Surf City and Chips arresting Beach Boys for hanging ten, or even five. One has never surfed or even been to SeaWorld, but one does enjoy sunbathing. One reason for one's decision to relocate to Southern California was the observation that, even for Orange County Republicans, one aspect of the pursuit of happiness was getting a good tan. So it was fondness for the lifestyle that prompted one to begin a journal. Given one's age and the relevant risk factors, one had little hope of communicating with one's future self. Although one never kept a journal, one did become a writer, and for a time did write fiction, some actually published. But a fiction writer has to create a semblance of truth sufficient to entice a reader into a willing suspension of disbelief, and one realized success depended on shaping the action to what the reader was prepared to see as truth. As a black American, one found this limiting. In truth, one had grown weary of imagining dramatic opportunities to support the plot with corrective information. For example, no, we aren't all Baptists, but Democrats, or ghetto dwellers. Yes, the Cherokees were slaveholding sycophants who got what they deserved. But one still had faith that a story well told could change minds as well as hearts, and so began to work in a different genre, creative nonfiction. The difference being that fiction was based on impossible things imagined before breakfast. Creative nonfiction could be based on improbable things that could not be imagined before a lunch that included several cocktails with an assigning editor. Creative nonfiction required no suspension of disbelief. Disbelief was welcomed for the existence was actual, so the most more improbable, the better. For the creative nonfiction writer's watchword is initialized Y-C-M-T-S-U, which stands for, pardon the language, you can't make this shit up. The genre's pioneers were daredevils who went places and did things and sometimes did not survive. They were akin to photojournalists who sometimes fall prey to the illusion the camera lens is an invisible shield that can protect them from bombs, bullets, and political incarceration. One is no daredevil, 
but Wen Young was excited by the prospect of tax-deductible adventure. In Haiti, one spoke with persons whom the government had not approved for interviews. In West Africa, one made one's way across unguarded but officially closed borders between hostile nations. In South Africa, then still under apartheid, one entered black townships, although, according to one's visa, one was white. And in America, one visited places where old-time racial conflicts were not forgotten and repetition not unimaginable. One followed old, old Route 66, sleeping uneasily in cheap motels in what had been sundown towns. One rode shotgun on two on blacktop in rural North Carolina with a one-time exalted cyclops of the Ku Klux Klan at the wheel. One no longer seeks such adventure, nor does one need to. News feeds present a dozen improbable things before breakfast, although, admittedly, living in time zones three hours behind Washington, D.C., make that less remarkable. And while one does retremble for one's country, as a writer of creative nonfiction, one has become reliant, perhaps even dependent, on implications of what the late Robert, Senator Robert Kennedy labeled a Chinese curse. May he live in interesting times. Careful investigation indicates that both one's iPhone and the Wuhan virus, beg pardon, COVID-19, have a more genuine Chinese provenance. But as Kennedy went on to insist, times of danger and uncertainty are more open to the creative energy of men than any other time in history. If one were tactful, one could say the times were made interesting by COVID-19. In truth, long before the arrival of a foreign virus, there was pestilence in America, illnesses just as deadly that had been left untreated. One decided to keep a journal in the time of COVID-19 because with the deaths of thousands on the left hand and the possibility of one's own death on the right, one felt the need to remind oneself of, of what some call the forever war, a term which originated in 1974 during another extended existential era with objectives no one military or civilian seemed able to articulate or of a festering prison established offshore so the Constitution would not entirely apply and lack of sufficient evidence of visible trial would be grounds for ongoing incarceration. Of an epidemic of opioids ravaging not only the urban village, but the rural hamlet, driven not by pushers, but physicians and pharmaceutical companies. Of a swelling population of homeless people, many of them damaged by drugs or mental illness, too many of them disgracefully discarded veterans of that new forever war. A fractured immigration and naturalization policies which created a new criminal elite and a new class of non-citizens, free persons technically and often of color, but slaves as surely as Dred Scott. Of mental disorders and the institutions of law and order, cash bail, civil asset forfeiture, and police misconduct, including, but not limited to, excessive use of lethal force. With metastatic racism that complicated every ailment of and corrupted every organ in the American body politic. So one decided, rather than wring one's hands or wash them while singing happy birthday, one would make a record of one's experiences and reflections in what was surely an interesting time and transform that so-called Chinese curse into a blessing. Now I had uh, timed this out to uh, sort of stop here because we were given 25 minutes, but unfortunately uh, my co-reader cannot be with us. So uh, I'm going to go on to uh, another place. Before I do that, I, I just want to, I was going to cut the part about creative nonfiction, but I realized that there's something I wanted to say in connection with it. And that is at a crucial point in my career, um, I was tran transitioning from uh, fiction, fiction writer to creative nonfiction writer. I met a man named Barry Lopez who talked to me, not, you know, I won't make a big deal out of it, but um, he was one of those pioneers. And um, we've lost him recently. And I feel his loss. Um, <clears throat> this was <laughs> one of the things I decided to do with the Journal of the Plague until further notice was to um, use voices 
that were not mine. Um, as you may have heard, I, I refer to myself as one because I got tired of I. Um, I think there's probably been a, too much of I in our country for a while. Um, it's nice to be called one, I think, uh, although we're all in this together. Um, this is a section called On Juneteenth. And I want to, there's a, a reference in here to uh, a classical music station. Uh, it is not KWAX. I miss KWAX. I listen to KWAX sometimes, but there's just not enough uh, kilo whatever that, you know, to get good thing on the stream. So I reserve it for special occasions. Uh, and Katerina and Rocky, thank you for many uh, fine e afternoons and evenings. Um, this is called On Juneteenth, and it's dedicated for, to a woman named Butterfly McQueen, who uh, was the woman, pris the maid in Gone with the Wind. Uh, she had an interesting life. Um, we forget that these, you know, these people don't stay on the screen. And, I don't know, it's interesting. But anyway, book her up, Butterfly McQueen. Um, this is sort of her voice if she grew up and but stayed in Atlanta and became, well, you'll hear what she became. God and God and God. The white folks done discovered Juneteenth. That's the holiday persons of color out in Texas made to mark the date the slaves out there found out about Abe Lincoln done signed the Emancipation Proclamation. That was back in 1863, but the slaves don't find out about it till 1865. Now it's 2020, but the white folks just finding out. They all head up about it. You should have heard the nice white lady on the classical music station saying she done bench Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms to play Samuel Taylor, Coleridge Taylor, Florence Price, and Marian Anderson because it'd be June 19th, June 16th, so we celebrating the end of slavery in the United States. I was going to call, call her and tell her it wasn't the whole United States. Proclamation didn't do diddly for slaves in Delaware and Missouri. Dred Scott did, but he, the rest had to wait till December 18th. Did a lot of good down here though, after the Yankees come in 1864 and tore the place up. I didn't call because nice white folks be fragile. If they get the, the tails crooked and the person of color sets them straight, their minds go to flinders and the person of color and allow to get cut by the shrubs. About 10 years before that proclamation, Fred Douglas go and asked the white folks, what to the slaves is your 4th of July? They so broke up, they wouldn't let him speak to the 5th. Last year, most white folks never heard of Juneteenth. Most persons of color neither. This year, the white folks are on board, as they say. They takes a day off from the 4th, now they want Juneteenth off too. But the boss says, I got to work both days, because I is essential. I doubt them persons of color in Texas could afford to take Juneteenth off. One minute they find out they ain't been slaves for two years and a half. Next minute they find out they hired labor and got to work for wages. Next minute they find out Mass a day employer and set the wage. Then he say, he owned their cabins, so they got to pay rent. I wonder, did them persons of color get two years and a half back pay? I don't think so. Ask me, I think the white folks on board because they bothered, bored, and with wor working from home. Of course, the day in the cabin, not, not the whole. But they responded to what they had a roller done up in Minneapolis last month, which was put his knee in the neck of an unarmed, handcuffed person of color for about nine minutes. For some persons of color, no, just the same old, same old. Paterol has been putting knees on necks since Joshua 10.24. Ten years back, them Minneapolis Paterol was done the same thing, except it was only four minutes. The video was shaky, but you could hear the one Paterol calling his wife saying he'd be late for dinner because he think he just killed a guy. <laughs> that the same old, same old too. White folks think what on TV be what paddlers do for real. Chicago PD come close with that cave to cop base in the cop shop basement, but there's lots of cages and lots of basements, and not just in Chicago. 
white folks think the pattern will always cover up. When they kill a person of color, they want all the persons of color to know. Communication essential one. Uh, I want the essential one of 10 principles of community policing. White folks think they read all about it in news, the newspaper or in the conclusions of the investigations. But the investigation, if there is one, start with what the pattern rollers say in their reports. There's this outfit down in Texas that makes a living telling pattern rollers what to say to make what they've done match what the Supreme Court say it's okay to do. Pattern roller ain't got nothing but a GED, but the reports sound like Scalia or Clarence Thomas. So that's the end of it. Hm, unless in this video. That's what happened out in L.A. 30 years back. The TV station got a videotape of about a dozen pattern rollers beating the color out of a person thereof and put it on the air because if it leads, it bleeds, it leads. White folks set up, so head up, they put the pattern rollers on trial. I wouldn't believe it except I saw it on court TV. Didn't matter because to all the white folks, just set, jury says, not guilty. Persons of color in L.A. disagreed but they were speaking the language of the unheard. That person of color did not die. This time, the person of color in Minneapolis did. This time, there was good video. The white folks see the man die on the cell phone six inches from their faces, and he should have seen them faces. I'm sorry he did, but I did enjoy seeing white folks shock white. What shocked me was, even when the white folks joined the protest, the pattern rollers never missed a beat down. They knocked down young white girls and told white men and just kept on stepping. A couple got suspended and their friends up and quit. I expect they hired on at the penitentiary. But most of them didn't even take the day off because they having too much fun throwing tear gas grenades and shooting rubber bullets. Down here in Atlanta, a person of color was sitting in his car. He blocking traffic, but he ain't hit nothing. Pattern roller say, park the car over there. Person of color, park the car over there. Pattern roller say, get out the car. Person of color gets out the car. Person pattern roller does the frisk. Don't find nothing. But he says, hands behind your back, and pulls out the cuffs. Person of color runs. White folks wonder, why he run? Could be he remembered that person of color in Minneapolis was cuffed before they put the knee on his neck. Could be he remembered the handcuffed Houdini in Louisiana that shot himself with both hands cuffed behind his back. Or the one in Arkansas had done the same. Could be he remembered that Paterola song and the song he get away. In Atlanta he got two bullets in the back. More than rubber neither. <clears throat> White folks talking about change. About defunding Paterolas or Getting rid of them, except in their neighborhood, I expect. I say, change the uniform. If a patrol would say he shot some unarmed body because he in fear for his life, make him wear yellow. And I say, make orange the new blue. I think when white folks says change, they need rebrand. They put that Paterola song on YouTube and left out the words because they're offensive, but they kept the music and calls it a traditional Southern Appalachian folk tune. White folks at Mars Food been say ben, being converted ain't good enough. Uncle Ben got to evolve. White folks at Quaker Oats going to take Aunt Jemima off the box. I wonder if they're going to take that old white man off the box too. And going forward, as they say, are they going to be friendly oats? I do like seeing the kids out there pulling down statues together, as they say. It definitely a step up from just marching around singing We Shall Overcome. And I'd be out there with them if I wasn't essential. Of course, there ain't no point to it. Those folk gone, be gone and dead to hell, but that's God's judgment. The evil do live after them, but it ain't in the statues. It's in the statute books. I understand the kids read Harry Potter so they think they can make things different with obliviate charm or something, whatever you say. What I don't understand is why they so down on Christopher Columbus. Chris claimed the land, but he say treat the people right so they convert to Catholics. I think the kids got Chris confused with his brother Bart. He the one stole the gold in the canoe, left his baby mama and sailed to Africa. But frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn about nobody's graven image. 
The books say uh, they had an abomination under the Lord. But some white folks all had about what the kids doing, and don't know nothing about birth. I don't know nothing about birthing no babies, but I do know the kids ain't to blame. If they wrong, they've been confused by progressive pedagogy. When I was finishing school, arithmetic was getting progressed into new math, and the kids behind me couldn't read a clock or make change for a dollar. Now my history been progressed into social, emotional learning. The kids think the N word sinful, unless it be in a rap, but they don't know where the word come from. The only river in Africa they know about is denial. This getting worse if they go to college. Textbooks say there ain't no difference between the shadow and the act. If their kids are colored, they know better, but they still got to pass the test. If they want to be a professor of colored, they got to lose their mother wit to get that PhD. But sooner or later, some nice white lady gonna see them going into a house in her neighborhood and call the patter rollers. The patter roller might call them sir or ma'am, but he ain't gonna call them professor. And he gonna keep one hand on his gun and make them prove they be what they've been working their whole life trying to be. And if they gets upset, he gonna whip out the cuffs and write into the report that the use of force was justified because they exhibited tumultuous manner. They wouldn't let me in a college except to wax the floor. And I sure don't read no textbooks. But I know the books say the kingdom is not in word, but in power. All the white folks, they love the words. They keep saying we in this virus thing together. We ain't been together since they united the states. The Constitution say there's free persons and all other persons. The Supreme Court say the word citizen don't include persons of color. When the person of color come here from Alabama with the compromise, saying we can be separate as the fingers on the hand and persons of color don't need no opera, the white folks say, okay, if the left hand, if the, so is that the left hand? Now, on the, now they on board with Juneteenth because it's separate, it's separate from the fourth. And instead of hemming and hawing about that, the declaration, they can shout about the proclamation. Never mind that the day before he signed that proclamation, he signed a contract shipping persons of color to Haiti. Oh, they've always been their go-to guy. <laughs> 1876. Centennial celebration. Mr. Lincoln, he did, but there's a statue. Old Abe with that proclamation in his hand and a person of color at his feet. The person of color on one knee. But back then, white folks don't find that disrespectful. When they do the dedication, they got Fred Douglas speak. It's Good Friday, so they guess they figure Fred going to just tote the cross up the hill. <laughs> Big mistake. Fred set them white folks straight. 1939. Daughters of the American Revolution say Constitution Hall not available for a concert by Marian Anderson. Go to the Lincoln Memorial, a new statue. Old oh, Abe, 19 feet tall, even though he's sitting down. Marian Anderson standing up, white columns round her like she's in a cage. So she closed her eyes and starts with America. She ends with nobody knows the trouble I see. But in the between, she sings Donizetti. She shamed the birds. Mm. 1963, the person of color coming to D.C. to cash Old Abe's check. The archbishop on board. But then he hear John Lewis going to say patience is a dirty word and threaten to jump ship because he say Catholics believe in this world word patience. John Lewis, take that part out. Go to the Lincoln Memorial. Away been 170 tons of white Georgia marble overseeing. Paterolers hiding behind him in case they need to pull the plug. John Lewis, he let go. Mahalia Jackson, the grumble gospel. She all right, but she ain't no Marian Anderson. Martin Luther, Luther King do America his way. He got that cross scar reminding him, so he ended with the spiritual that make dying sound like emancipation. 2020. <laughs> Can't go to the Lincoln Memorial, so we get on board with Juneteenth. But I wonder, do the little children know what Fred Douglas say about old Abe? And I wonder, what Juneteenth got to do with the Patterolls? Patterolls was started in slavery days. Didn't need no Black Lives Matter then. Slaves cost money. Slaves was money. Patterola kept to run away. Maybe rough him up some, but if a Patterola kill a slave, that Patterola have to pay. These days, the city pays. Ten years back, Minneapolis paid three million. Of course, the lawyers took two. But I wonder, did the city take the money out the Patterola pension fund? 
I do not think so. My point is, ain't no slavery these days. I call myself a wage slave. Says my boss a slave driver. But I ain't been being literal. I can quit if I want to. I get time and a half for overtime. I can, so why I got the deal with the Paterolas? The college textbook says words offensive. What I find offensive is having to be on the lookout for Paterolas when I ain't broke no law and having to remind myself if them red and white, blue lights come on, yes, say yes, officer, no, officer, don't get too tumultuous and say, yes, this my car, this my damn driveway, and this my goddamn house. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm glad I'm essential. I appreciate the overtime, but I, I get flashbacks. Every time the boss asks, can I work late, I remember. Every time I'm driving home late, I remember. Every time I park in the drive at midnight, I got to sit still till my heart slows down because I remember when I was in fear for my life. I can't think about that no more. Not now. Bedtime. Tomorrow will be another day. My alarm go off. Bring! And I got to get up and kill that rat. It'd be Saturday, so the Metropolitan Opera would be on the classical station. They wouldn't let Mary Anderson sing there either until 1955. Then they made her play the witch in Umbala de Mascara. But long before that, they had persons of color playing Egyptian. Because if you're going to do Aida right, good gypsum would be essential. Tomorrow it ain't Aida, it's Aknaten. That gypsum too, but Philip Glass. <laughs> he all right, but he ain't no verity. And there won't be no hotcakes for breakfast, because Aunt Jemima free at last. No cream wheat, neither. But the NAACP swear, by supper time, we're going to have success rice. Thank you all very much. Um, I hope you're still here. <laughs> and if I understand correctly, we have questions. Um, Yes. We're all the question. question. Um, Wendy, uh, do you have anything come in or um, shall I just start ahead? Um, I don't have anything that came in. Um, uh, some suggestions of gratitude and that's about it. So that's great. That's good. Okay. Well, um, thank you for the really the variety of your reading is just really quite stunning. It was just really, really enjoyable. Um, I wanted to, to start just by talking to you a little bit about time in your writing, and then we'll move to what you've read more specifically. But uh, when I was when I was reading um, the Cheneysville incident, um, I I noticed in just in the the early part there. You've really got several tiers of time. I mean, you've got, first of all, J Professor John's moving into uh, a specific incident where he's going to be look, taking care of his um, old Jack. And then you have the recollection of him being nine years old and his connection with, with old Jack. And then you have Jack talking about the past and this the young boy's father and you've got this kind of three-tiered thing so I, I the question i've got is um how and especially are you fascinated by the way one time frame informs another and forms another and that was of course it was also very much a part of your your final monologue tonight but can you talk a little bit about that uh <laughs> You know, I'm writing, right now, I'm writing the, a new introduction or an introduction to the Cheneysville incident. So, so people will buy it again because if they already had it, then, you know, then, and that, and it's tricky because the last line, and I'm, I work to get the last line right, is to talk about how it's different to approach a text that was written at one time and another time. Um, the Chinese incident was supposed to be, or was when it was written, it was written contemporaneously. So it was now looking back. And it was 
but it was always now. And uh, 40 years later, it's an entirely different experience. Even thinking about it is different. Um, there's a section that um, I'm going to have to cut out of the introduction, I guess, but the, the characters, two characters, they're an interracial couple. And I was thinking at the time, well, what, what do they know? What, what is, and they face this problem that was, that was, you know, the question that faced people at that time. What happens to the children? Um, there was no way that either they or I could comprehend the possibility of the first mixed race president. I mean, that would have, if you would have gone to those people. Now, they know, knew everything. I mean, I can make a list of the things that, as I have it, the list of things they knew. They knew about um, when marriage, interracial marriage was illegal. They knew when Loving v. Virginia made it legal. They know that there are still problems, but nobody's going to drag them out of their beds at the 2 a.m. in the morning. But if you said, well, you know, if you work it out between you and you stay together, your kid could be president in the United States. Say what? <laughs> you know. So you know the, the the relationship between the time is really it's fascinating for me now because I mean I've never read the book, but um, it's uh, those those connections are are always fascinating because you know there's a lot of stuff in between that doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. And that's you know what what you remember what you go back to I you know I got a letter from a guy the other day and he was talking about he's my age and he was talking about his draft number his lottery number and I said wow you know there's probably not an American man my age our age who doesn't remember his lottery number it was that important that that night when you sat there and watched them pick you know right. It's it's something that we would share. Nobody, I mean, try explaining that to somebody who's fifty. They don't know what that means. So when you're writing, you have to sit there and think. Well, remember, you're old now. <laughs> you know, they aren't going to know what that means. <laughs> but it's fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I was also wondering what freedoms around this issue, you know, in time, you found in writing a journal in the play gear, what, you know, I, I'm thinking, uh, they say that when Jane Austen was writing Saniton, she was confined to her bed. So she wrote a, the most open air of her work. She never finished it. In fact, she just got started on it. But it was a way for her of getting outside this confinement. And I was just wondering, what sort of freedoms did you find in writing as I'm I guess you're continuing to write write this this journal in the play gear what what did, what did it give for you in terms of liberation uh, well it, as you probably heard in that last piece you know when you're not you're not censoring yourself when you know, I'm not censoring myself and mm -hmm. you know in the years of acad in academia you know you sort of learn to bite your tongue and you sort of learn not to say things and not not because you're fr because you know like yeah you know what yeah you know <laughs> you know what I'm saying yeah, yeah. you know yeah it's, uh, you're always talking about that yeah. but yeah. this is a, a moment when you know those things keep coming to the fore and you know, to respond to them in on you know in time more or less. I mean, I do go back and do revisions, um, but you know, I mean, the notes that I take at the time are what happened that day, and that's weird because you forget you forget the kind of constant assault. I mean, there's this this thing a news feed that says coronavirus today, and I'm saying you know every day nothing happens. You know, it's not like anything happened yesterday, but we got coronavirus today. Um, it's okay. Well, there's a, so I've got a piece called Coronavirus Today, and the rest of the time I don't look at that news. I look at other things. Mm -hmm. And it's a way of, of deciding, okay, I'm boring myself with this, so let's look somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, 
I think I think it's easy to get obsessed, and it's hard to get obsessed when you're writing about it. And what and what what freedoms did you find in uh, taking on Butterfly's voice? Well, the, 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 that's that piece started with the shooting in Atlanta of the, the guy who parked his car. Mm -hmm. And then I started finding out all this crazy stuff about, okay, we're going to, Uncle, Uncle Ben has to evolve and all this stuff. And I'm thinking, like, these people are crazy. I mean, it's like this stuff is not going to make any difference. But her voice was, I mean, she always had a great voice, not just in the book, but in the movie. And when I looked into what, what she'd done later in her life, ah, I mean, you know, she had a fascinating life. And, you know, nobody knows about it. So I just wanted to bring her back to life, but to also use the kind of voice that she had as Prissy to sort of say things that, you know, probably, probably I would say, but in a more, um, more mannered style. And she just, she's an essential worker, man. She got no time. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and I also, yeah, also felt a certain amount of timelessness in her voice. Yeah, her, it's... Uh, her perspective, her perspective was timeless. Well, you know, it, Gone with the Wind is timeless. I'll worry about it tomorrow, you know? Um, there's a reason that bad novel won the Pulitzer Prize. I, mean, it, I used to teach it because it won the Pulitzer Prize the same year that William Faulkner didn't. Um, and I used to teach those books side by side, Absalom and Absalom and, and Gone with the Wind. <laughs> and say, okay, and I mean, nobody who loves literature would choose... You know, gone with the wind. <laughs> what were they thinking? You know, and you put yourself in. Okay, what were, what were they thinking in 1936? Why was that? You know, it's. A, but I love that voice. I love her freedom, and, and she was a free-thinking woman. Mm -hmm. So you know, is, is there, there a, uh, a for you? And can you still hear me? Okay. Is there an evolution for you in in your sense of, uh, let's just say, um, men's roles um, over time? Like, it seems like the Chains Bill incident, as, as much as I've read of it, is very concerned about what it takes to make a man. You know, that's one of the things that Johnny's discovering. Um, and there's some discussion between him and old Jack about Johnny having a woman in him, but also man in him. Has your sense of that, of what it takes to be a man evolved over time, changed much since the Cheneysville, when you wrote the Cheneysville incident? For example, now you've adopted the voice of a woman completely in, in what you just last read. Is, has there been an evolution for you? Has it, or has it pretty much stayed the same? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, characters say what characters say. Um, old Jack is an old guy. He was, he was born around 1909. He has reasons to dislike women. Uh, they, they treated him badly. Uh, and he has uh, his, own, his own perceptions. I have to write his perceptions as he would have them. Uh -huh. that, doesn't, that doesn't mean I necessarily share them. I do think that some of the things he says um, are true. And I think that's what you try to do when, you know, I, I try to listen to people. And it's easy in this society to hear the surface of what people are saying and dismiss them because the surface of them is, but, you know, some people have a very rough surface. <laughs> and you have to get underneath and say, where are they coming from? What's, what's that all about? Uh, I made reference, for example, in, in that piece I just let, read to uh, what Henry Gates went through when he was, you know, you know, everybody skipped Gates on TV, right, right, right? And the cops pulled him out of his own house. Um, people don't know about that. People forget about that. But, but, you know, you think, well, where did he, well, Skip came from West Virginia, not far from where I grew up. And over the years, we've run into each other and we've had conversations about what things were like there. Um, now, this guy is Harvard up to Wazoo, Yale, Harvard, you know, whatever. He certainly doesn't talk like people talk in West Virginia, but he knows how. <laughs> you know? One of the things that I've tried to do is, um, is not forget how. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, we're well, coming we're... to the end of our program. Um, this has been just such a rich experience, David. Um, and I, I appreciate the fact you've given us such a range of your writing, you know, um, and to just to investigate your writing and in all of its spectrum is just a very, very scintillating experience. So I really appreciate your coming here tonight. Um, I, I, I want to uh, just alert everybody to the fact that uh, readings like this occur on the uh, third Tuesday of the month and that we have coming up for us uh, a group of a very interesting writers also. We're having um, next, uh, coming up soon, we're, we're having um, March 16th, Mike Van Metken, a great, this very good fiction writer, we're very, very remarkable, and Amber Flame, a wonderful young um, poet and they'll be re reading, as I said, on March 16th. On April 20th, we have the poet Eric Goss, Erica Goss and Karen McPherson, who was actually one of our coordinators for uh, a couple of years here. And then uh, on May 18th, as I reminded you, uh, we will be having uh, Susan Moore, who wasn't able to be here tonight. Um, I want to thank both Wendy and David for helping so much in the part of this program. And uh, and I, I hope that uh, we see you again very soon. Uh, anything else you'd like to add, Wendy? Uh, no, I just wanted to thank everybody for coming. And um, I am very much looking forward to next month as well. This was such a wonderful reading. Thank you so much, David. David. It's been my pleasure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. This is strange. <laughs>